I love this. Their eyes were open and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? So that's what I said. That's what I'm calling it. Open our eyes, Lord. This is a prayer. Open our eyes. Set our hearts ablaze. And while you're reading through this, okay, I didn't even really tell you what the, what the handout was, but it's all the resurrection appearances from the, the, the beginning when he sees Mary in the, in the garden and she thinks he's a gardener all the way through to when he, uh, you, you read in the book of Acts that he's taken up. But he also appeared to Paul, right? So we'll get into that. But what a good prayer. Open my eyes today and set my heart ablaze for you. Even if I'm going into a secular job, even if I'm doing a boring routine job, I can still be praising the Lord while I'm doing that. I could still have an earbud in my ear and I could be listening to the word. I could be worshiping God while I'm in the midst of that. And it's amazing what a better mood you're in when somebody gives you a hard time. If you've been worshiping, you don't want to come out of your flesh. And you don't want to let that gorilla out of the cage, as I've said before. <laughs> All right? And then right near the end of the chapter here in Luke 24, it says, Then he opened their minds. Not that he just opened their eyes. He, this is all the disciples now. He opened their minds. Wouldn't you like the Lord to give you this kind of revelation? And we say, open heaven over my life, Lord. Let there be an open channel between heaven and earth so that just like Jesus only did what he saw you do and heard you say, we want to live in that constantly. A full awareness. Well, I have a job and I have to concentrate. What about asking him to help you on your job? That's legal. He never slumbers or sleeps. So Jesus is talking to them. He opened their minds so they could comprehend the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures. And this is what the scripture said, Jesus, that the promised anointed one should suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. That in his name, a radical change of thought and life should be preached. See, that's us telling us, so good to see you in church. How you feeling? Awesome. Beautiful. Good to see you. A radical change of life. So you have people on your job and they wonder, like, what's different about you? How come your life looks different? You don't do the things that, that the rest of us do. And, you know, on Wall Street, they go out to bars afterwards and they take clients out. And they're told they have to spend a certain amount of money. Like, it's really not, not a, it doesn't dovetail well with the Christian life. Unless you're going to be a witness while you're there, right? So... Radical change of thought and life is part of, of the message that he wants us to preach and that in his name, forgiveness of sins be preached, starting in Jerusalem and then extending to all nations. So if you're not sure about what your mission is, this is one of them, is that you're an ambassador and you're an emissary. And I talked about how hard it is to stay with your heart ablaze because our flesh keeps trying to rise up and, and obstacles come up in the way and we get distracted by things. And it's like, no, like every morning I want to start by saying, Lord, I need your help today. And I don't want to fall short of, of the opportunities that you put before me. Not a works mentality, but just a listening mentality. Show me when an opportunity arises that I can step into. Then he said to them, you have witnessed the fulfillment of the, these things, that there's a radical new way of living and a new way of thinking, and that we're going to talk about that to people. So I'm sending my Father's promise to you. Who would that be? A little louder, please. What an amazing gift that is that we have Holy Spirit in us. But he doesn't just take over unless you yield to him. And, and I find often that that's a war in my heart because what, the way he would want me to respond is not the way my natural nature, the part that's still alive, would want me to respond. And it says, stay in the city until you receive it, until power from heaven comes upon you. And if there was a Luke chapter 25, which there isn't, but the next verse that's written by Luke is Acts chapter 1. So, wow, what, this man wrote more than anybody else. I know everybody thinks Paul wrote the most, but when you really boil it down, it's Luke, who wasn't a Jew, right? Trained as a physician, very meticulous, brilliant writer, as, as brilliant as Paul was as well. Like the two of them make a one-two combination. But all the chapters of Luke and all the chapters of, of Acts, that's a lot, right? If you read those together, it's one continuous story. So the gospel ends, but the book of Acts picks up for part two. And we'll get into that in a little bit. 
So I, I touched on this a couple weeks ago. It says, God, the God who spoke light into existence, saying, let light shine from the darkness, is the very one who sets our heart ablaze. Right? So can you just touch the person next to you if they're comfortable with you doing it? And so I pray the Lord will set your heart ablaze every day that you will live with a blazing heart for Jesus. Hey, it says it right in here, 2 Corinthians 6. The same God that spoke the world into existence is the one who's inside you and sets your heart ablaze. And I love the rest of this. It's not just for you. It's because when your heart is ablaze, you shed light through your life of the knowledge of God's glory revealed in the face of Jesus, the anointed one. And then there's this great word in the Bible, but... You don't have to qualify. It's not, a, it's not about your credentials. It's not about all your natural ability. You know, you have to be a certain height or have a certain IQ or get a certain score on a test. It's how willing you are to yield to God and be that vessel that he can pour himself through. Because it's contained in us. This beautiful treasure is contained in Peter Roselli. Well, that's not so great, right? Because he's got some flaws, doesn't he? Cracked pots made of earth and clay. Why? So that transcendent character of God's power will be clearly seen as coming from God and not from Peter or Jim <laughs> or Tricia or Nate. It's all got to be about him. Right? Not to us, Lord, but unto your name be all the glory. So I found this commentary in Exodus 31. Moses encountered God. Right? He goes up on the mountain when nobody else wanted to get anywhere near that mountain. There was fire and lightning and all this, you know, very scary things happened. And they said, Moses, you go. You know, we don't want to be there. Through the Spirit on Mount Sinai. But in the New Covenant, the Spirit dwells in the hearts of us. So, man, it's just good to be reminded of that. And like I said, we're in between the day... Jesus rose, the resurrection, and the celebration 50 days from now. And I would just, I would just challenge you to read that, this, these six pages, through that lens. And what a different world it was once Jesus came out of that tomb. Even before Holy Spirit falls on the day of Pentecost, he's already signaling to them what it's going to be like. And what it's going to be like not just to die to go to heaven, as great as that is. I don't want to go to hell, for sure. But what the future hope that we have, it's really hard for us to grasp. So the transformation that's in our lives when we say yes to the Lord is based on a new way of understanding God's revelation. And you know, I'm sorry to say the, the religious spirit, that, that structure that we seem to always want to put everything into an explanation, doesn't leave a lot of room for God to improvise with us and show us what he's trying to say in the daily application of Scripture. It's based on a new way of understanding God's revelation. Jesus himself was the real revealer of God's glory, and he's the image of God. Through this spirit-enabled encounter, believers experience a new way of living and therefore come to resemble Jesus. All right? I know that's a lot of words, but I, the verse I quoted said, the spirit's inside you to shine out of you. And the more you can yield to that spirit and the more you can put your flesh to death and the more you can get counseling and find out where the obstacles are. What are some of the roots in your system? If you have bad fruit, there's probably a bad root there somewhere. And we only can produce either good fruit or bad fruit. <laughs> and we're all producing fruit every day. So this is a beautiful thing about just drilling down on what the Lord wants for us is, Lord, I want the impurities taken out. And then I showed you this picture. I won't go through it in detail. But, you know, like I said, a lot of believers are living below where they should be aiming when it comes to the motivation. At least this is my experience in my life. And obviously, we don't want hell as our internal inheritance right on the bottom. But then you go through these levels of of. of conditions that can happen to people. It's not meant to be judgmental in any way, but how many know backslidden Christian? And how difficult that is to be that backslidden Christian because you know the word and, and, you're, and you know deep down inside you've got to block out the pain of knowing that you're being disobedient. Or living as a Christian and your only goal really is to just to make sure you make the cut and get into heaven when you die. That's not going to keep you going. You can't keep your heart ablaze just trying to avoid hell. And similar, you know, a carnal Christian, somebody 
who's clearly, you know, just not taking it serious. They call themselves a Christian, but, but just by their own lifestyle, you could see that they don't believe it because they're not being obedient to what the word would say. I think religious legalism is one of the worst ones of all because there's a self-righteousness about that one. And there's that old nature that Paul was saying, all the things I used to count as important, meaning how he was so good at following the law, and that's how they would measure your success, how well you could memorize the laws and then follow the rules. And the law was given to us to prove that we can't follow all the rules. So, wow, he had this wonderful revelation that it's about a relationship with God, not a bunch of rule following. And I've been working in New York for 30 plus years, and if you just stopped people on the street and asked them what they thought about Christians, one of the first negative things they'd say is judgmental. I get the feeling when I'm with them that they think they're better than me. And that's not Jesus, is it? He didn't do that to people, but somehow we get this coating of arrogance because we know the rules and whether it's intentional or not, we should fight it. Just fight it off. Stay humble. Right? We all live in a glass house. So put your stones down. <laughs> then hearts ablaze. And then the returning remnant. That's what I called it last week. So if I get up every morning and I'm picturing, well, at least I'm not going to hell. <laughs> that's not a great motivator for me. But if I picture my heart ablaze and I'm returning with Jesus someday, I'll go the extra mile. I'm going to stay up a little longer and study a little harder and write something. I think that's what happens as you get older. You get to write things down and, and share it in a book or online or however. So why should other, everybody else make the mistakes you made? Let them learn from your mistakes. And thank God Peter Wagner did that. That helped me tremendously, right? So I'm going to move on. It says, these things, in 1 John 2, these things, I told you I mentioned propitiation, so hopefully you'll see it fit in. I write to you so that you may not sin. Now, we have a lot of our leaders on the front row here, and we talk to people and we counsel people. And if there was some formula that we could give you a pill so that you wouldn't commit a sin, that would be a bestseller in the Christian world, right? Some way we could boost your spiritual immune system so that you wouldn't sin. But, but I tell you, as you look around, this is part of the spiritual immune system, the fact that you're in a body of believers who are believing God for miracles, right? Remember, Jesus said, I got to put some of these people out of the room because we're going to pray for healing, and we need as much faith in the room as possible. And when you're surrounded by people who say, well, maybe it's God's will that you be sick, that wouldn't be our theology. I don't really want that person to pray for me because... I don't think it is God's will that I be sick. And I want to live here in abundance while I'm here. I know there's a point at a time for me to go. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm going to keep on being busy about my father's business in the meantime. So I want to be aligned with people who are aligned with heaven. And it doesn't mean that if you pray for somebody and, and they don't get well that you're somehow deficient. It's that there's a war going on. And there's casualties in wars. And, it, and God's will is not always done. It would be God's will to heal everybody, but it doesn't always happen. But we don't stop praying. So, wow, I write these things to you so you may not sin. But then he has this wonderful verse, too, that says, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So before I was a Christian, I knew I was sinning. I just didn't think it was a big deal because I thought it was all just a fake religion. And we were raised in a denomination that told us not to read the Bible. So I didn't know the word. All I saw was the religious routine of it all. And plenty of people got saved in that setting. I didn't. I was turned off to it and I went out into the world. And I knew it was wrong through that lens, but I didn't think there was any authority in the lens. Then I got saved. Then my eyes were open. So, wow, I sure was glad when I found out that it was real that I had an advocate with the Father who's going to stand in the gap for me, right? So, yeah, I don't want to sin as a Christian, but do we? Everybody better say yes, or that would be a sin too if you said you never sin. <laughs> he himself is the propitiation. Man, never saw that word anywhere but in the Bible for our sins. And not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. How do you get your hands around that one? 
that he died on that cross for the sins of everybody before him, those that were alive then, and everybody that was going to come after him. Because in the beginning, he was with God. Before the world was, he was there. So that's why he's the only perfect sacrifice that can be that propitiation, because he was the perfect sacrifice. And I looked it up, and propitiation means to, to make favorably inclined to appease or to conciliate. And again, I know there's a lot of us on the front row here who do counseling. And if, if you've ever been married, you know there might be a time when you're not getting along with your spouse. Anybody? Want to be, be real with me here? Did you ever have an argument? Okay. Well, you might need somebody to sit down with you and talk to you who knows the Bible and who's, not gonna, who's big enough to stop you from physically fighting each other in the room. <laughs> You need somebody to conciliate. We, we don't get more than two minutes into a discussion and we're screaming at each other. So if we sit down with a big guy in the middle, I can't believe what she does. So wait, no, let's just try to have a conversation. Let's calm this thing down. I love what it says, to make favorably inclined. You know, Trisha is God's daughter, Peter, before she's your wife. How are you treating my daughter, God would say. And I would say, well, how is she treating your son? What about that? You have to love her the way I love the church, and then she'll submit to you. Piece of cake. Not a piece of cake. I think the man has the harder job. I have to love her the way Christ loved the church. That's what the Bible says. Stop pounding your table that you have to submit to me if you're not loving her the way Christ loved the church. I know the women are real happy right now. It's definitely a harder job. That'll be another day's topic. But we all need someone to stand in the gap and help us resolve conflict. Because you're just not hearing the other person. You're just blocked. Something's blocking. And what does the enemy want? To steal, kill, and destroy. To drive a wedge in relationships. When we're together, to put 10,000 to flight. One, just 1,000. So why wouldn't the enemy want to drive a wedge between us? And then yet in Psalm 133, it says there's a place where God commands a blessing. Wow. When brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord commanded a blessing. So we're not... We're never going to be out of the job of conciliation. It almost sounds like the role in the mafia, right? Conciliary. I think it's the same word in there. Sonny's all mad. You're not a wartime conciliary, right? Oh, God. Flashback problem. Settle it down before we kill each other. And yet there was nothing that could get us in right standing with God because of the sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve, except Jesus the perfect substitute for what I needed in order for God not to take out his wrath on me. And there is going to be a judgment day. You don't hear much about that anymore, but it's right in the Bible. Read Matthew 25, sheep on one side, goats on the other. Right? Which one do you want to be in, church? Pretty easy, pretty easy choice. But it went another step, and it says conciliate means to overcome distrust <coughs> excuse me, or hostility to placate somebody. So usually there's some animosity going on if, they're, if we're having an argument, and I don't trust you. So this person who sits in the middle says, wait a minute, what did you love about your wife when you married her? And I go, oh, that's easy, man. She didn't take any guff from anybody. I forgot about me and her arguing. That might be a problem, though. Right? But it was that we weren't hearing each other. So this person sits in the middle filled with the Holy Spirit and translates the language. Have you thought about it this way? Have you thought about it that way? Because they're listening to God while they're listening to you. Overcome distress and hostility and placate. And then that same piece is in reconcile, isn't it? See how that C-O-N-C-I-L, it's in both words, to bring into agreement or harmony. I love this one, to reconsecrate. To make or declare sacred and set apart. And I've had to apologize to my wife for things I've said or arguments that we've had. It's a lack of consecration when I mistreat God's daughter. There's a defiling that goes on, but there's forgiveness. 
so we can be reconsecrated through this act of forgiveness, we become holy in that peace. Okay? Now, look, it's not a works mentality. It's got to be humble on your knees. Forgive me, Lord. Set me right. Get me in right alignment with you again so that I don't leak my anger and my temper out onto other people. I don't want to be a source of people needing to be reconsecrated. But what a wonderful tool that we can help people get in right alignment with God again. Amazing stories. I mean, if we ever wrote a book on the amount of people that have gotten healed, delivered, set free, it, it, you might not believe it. It's just amazing. All right, so I'm going to shift into, I'm, I'm heading towards second base now. About to round second, heading towards third. <laughs> so this is Colossians. Paul says it comes down to this. Since Easter, you have been raised, Easter Fraser in the front row here, you've been raised with the anointed one, the liberating king. You should set your mind on the things above. So yeah, I'm having a little issue here, but I know where I'm going. My present situation, you know this one, is not an indication of my future destination. Say it. My present situation is not an indication of my future destination. I didn't make that up, but I stole it pretty good, didn't I? I think about that all the time. Like, these are light and temporary afflictions compared to ruling and reigning forever. As tough as it might be to have to walk through it, nothing compares to what we're going to have with him. So that's what Paul's saying. You've already been raised from the dead through what Jesus did for you. He's the liberating king. So set your mind on the goal, the returning remnant who's going to rule and reign forever with Christ. The anointed is in that place. He's there, seated at God's right hand. So stay focused on what's above, not on the earthly things, because your old life is dead and gone. It just tries to resurrect once in a while, every day. <laughs> Your new life is now hidden and meshed. Isn't that a cool word? And meshed. My life is hidden. It's like when God had them in the desert, they were hidden by the cloud. The enemy couldn't see them because they're with their Lord. So what's he do? He throws out a lure to try to lure you out and get in your flesh. And then you come out from, from under the covering of the blessing. On that day when the anointed one whose our very life is revealed... You'll be revealed with him in glory. So don't go on lying. I jumped from verse 4 to 9, but this is so good. Don't go on lying to each other since you have shed your old skin, in quotes. Isn't that a good picture? Like a, like a snake that's molting. What a horrible word, molting. Man, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't sound good to me. Like you get, get rid of your old skin. But that's that old way of thinking that still keeps trying to come back in and and, and that's the beautiful thing about the word is that it's very convicting, but it's hard to keep reading something that's convicting you. And you keep thinking of other things to do instead of reading it because it's, you know, I, I've come to start saying all truth is inconvenient. There was a movie out called The Inconvenient Truth many years ago, right? But all truth is inconvenient to somebody. And you got to be pretty courageous to keep diving back into the Bible because it's a mirror. And if we really want to do it, we're going to have to make changes, won't we? But my old skin is gone now. I'm shedding it along with its evil practices, and it's been replaced by a fresh, new you, which is continually renewed in knowledge. I know a lot of people, when they look at their devotions in the morning, if they're going to spend your time in the Word, you've got to find a way to keep that fresh. So I know Trisha's taught about it many times. She'll start with worship. She'll open up Scripture, Psalms, start singing to the Lord, put worship music on, I could tell you from being married to her now, coming up on 37 years and four days, <laughs> that uh, there's no negotiating with her about her time with prayer in the morning. Doesn't matter where we are, doesn't matter who's asking her to do something at a certain time, I'll be available by a certain time, but not before. And that's been a great lesson for me about not just saying it, but doing it. And, and it's just like an anchor in her life that she's going to wait until she breaks through that day in prayer and, and to keep it fresh. That's what this means, continually renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created you. When I first got saved, I gave my Bible to my aunt. Her name was Aunt Ruth, and boy, did she need it. And uh, she, she said, well, what do I do with it after I read it? <laughs> 
<laughs> I know, we're all laughing, right? Because how many of you have read it about 100 times and you're still finding something new in there, right? This is about, but I'm saying, look, it's alive. The book's alive. It's got a heartbeat in it. Just keep reading it. You'll keep finding something new. In this recreation, oh, man, there's no distinction between Greek and Jew or circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and conqueror or slave and free. So can we just be real for a minute? This is really hard to do. He's basically saying you have no right to judge another human being in any area color of their skin, lack of education, whatever it is, if you're on this side of the cross with Jesus, you've got to look at everybody and say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, all things have passed away. Don't judge him on the hundred other times he let you down. He's in Christ now. Oh, he'll never change. I think that's a sin because you've just eliminated God from the picture. The angel told Mary, nothing's impossible with God, except this guy. No, no. That's a problem in your heart, that you just lost the ability for God to do something great in this person, whoever it is. And you're probably not praying for that person if you're saying they're never going to change. Just saying. The anointed is the whole and dwells in us all. So... I know, obviously, as a pastor of a church, I've studied the Bible, I prepare messages and sermons, but if it's not holding up in the mirror, <laughs> right, because I've still been working all these years, I preach on Sunday, and then i got to go to work on Monday. And guess what I hear loud and clear in my ear is everything I said the day before. <laughs> when I go to try it, well, wait a minute, this isn't just theory, this is practice. Not so easy to put it into practice, at least on Wall Street, I don't know about your job, but wasn't easy. And I've heard people say, well, it has to be the end times. Things are so bad. It's never been this bad before. Can I just tell you? It has been this bad before. <laughs> okay? We have no idea what it would have been like to live in during the days of the Romans, my ancestors who were the meanest people on the planet, crucifying people, no Miranda rights, no assumption of innocence. You know, you live in a country where you're assumed innocent until they can prove you're guilty. That should get a standing ovation. Nobody does that. You're in Russia right now. You're in China. You get disappeared. They've come up with a new term. That person was disappeared. No, I think I'm staying in America. Thank you very much. Anyway, I like it here. You know, is it perfect? No, but it's more, it's got more going for it than anywhere else that I've seen. So I want to just take you now to think through that lens for a minute. And I'm not saying things aren't bad right now. They're just not as bad as it's ever been. And look, what if it is the worst it's ever been? We should be that much more enthusiastic about serving the Lord and winning people to Christ. Because if he's coming back tomorrow, we're not going to stop talking to people. We're going to want to get them saved, right? So, okay, that's another day. So this picture helps me. Because this represents to me, you probably know that's the Parthenon in the middle. It's in Athens, and, and Paul had to be on trial, I think, you read about it in the book of Acts. He's on trial there. And he, and he says, God doesn't dwell, and I think he does one of these, in temples made with human hands. <laughs> right? He's, he's showing them the biggest thing that they were trusting in. And really, it's amazing what they were able to do without bulldozers and, you know, however they built this amazing city. But that represents to me man's efforts. And man's efforts are amazing, but they fall short by miles of what God can do. Because it's not about your efforts, it's about how God can transform us into his image, as broken as we might be. And you know, I, I've used it many times, but there's a lot of new people here. If you haven't seen the Joyce Meyer testimony called One Life, that would be a good one to watch with a box of tissues. It's free on YouTube, but she gives her testimony. And for what she went through, to what God has used her to do is a, a miraculous thing that happened, that she was able to overcome horrific treatment by her father, that I'm guessing people have taken their lives for less than what she had to go through. And now she's being used to touch millions of people. And, you know, she doesn't cry much, but she cries like, wait a minute, this is proof, this is living proof that no matter how bad it was, God can still turn it around. 
I'm not putting my trust in, in the efforts of man. Just never get there. You never arrive. There's always somebody with more money or a bigger house or whatever. But when it's God, it's this verse from Revelation 11:15. 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will rule forever and ever. We will rule with him forever and ever, not because we're better than other people, but because we submitted to him while we had the chance. You remember that song, Come, Now is the Time to Worship? One day every tongue will confess you are Lord. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure is to recognize it now. <laughs> bow now. Gladly choose you now, Lord. So that's, that's the daily routine. And if you're not trying to give your faith away, you, you build up, build up, build up in the word, but you're not releasing it. And you have to be able to release it to other people to get filled up again, okay? And I know we're not all wired to be evangelists, but this definitely helps. And, and why I put this picture up there is because I'm going to finish in the book of Acts. I'm almost done. But it's about Paul, and he's talking about when the Lord visited him, okay? Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the audible voice of God, but I'm guessing most of you could probably raise your hand and say, have you ever had an encounter with God where you knew it was real and it was really him? Could you raise your hand for a minute for those people that aren't raising their hands? That might encourage. They're actually waving at me from the lobby about that one. So whether it was an audible voice or however you know, but nobody could ever change your mind that you know that you were encountered by God. Okay, so when that happens, and Paul's seen as this really, like, defiant, rebellious guy. He was brilliant. He knew the Jewish law really well. And, and they, couldn't, they couldn't argue with him without losing the argument. He, he was so good at defending his position, and he was causing the Jews especially, a lot of problems. So he is now on trial and going up against King Agrippa in Acts 26, right? So you know that there's only 28 chapters in the book of Acts, right? So Acts 29.1 is today. <laughs> it, ends, it ends there, but now we're living in Acts chapter 29. So he's almost, it's, the, the book's almost finished here. There's only two chapters to go. And he's on his way to Rome because he said, I appeal to Caesar. It says He's talking to King Agrippa about how he was chasing down and persecuting the Jews. He said, I would find them in synagogues across Jerusalem and try to force them to blaspheme. <laughs> it's how hard the enemy works against your faith. You've got to know that when you're tried by fire, anything that's in there that can burn gets burned off. And what's left is the gold. So he was trying to force them to blaspheme. He said, my fury drove me to pursue them into foreign cities. On one occasion, I was traveling to Damascus, authorized and commissioned by the chief priests to find and imprison more of his followers. It was about midday, Your Excellency, King Agrippa, when I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the noonday sun, shining around my companions and me, we all fell to the ground in fear. They knew something was up. This was not a natural occurrence that was happening. God was putting up a stop sign and saying, no, Paul, you're done chasing down the Christians, and you're going to be commissioned into my army now, and today's your day. And then he says, then I heard a voice. The words were in Aramaic. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When you kick against the cattle prods, you're only hurting yourself. Stay on that one for a minute, okay? He's basically standing before King Agrippa, who has the ability to release him or send him off to Rome, where he's, uh, we know he will die. He's not the least bit worried about dying. He's totally given his testimony to this king. And he's just saying, what happened to him? I was on the road to go persecute Christians, a light brighter than the noonday sun came. We all heard the voice, knocked us down. And he's saying, you're only hurting yourself because you're defying what I want you to do. Please apply that to your own life. <laughs> Excuse me. When you feel the Lord is prompting you in a certain way and you have people around you that you trust and you love and you're accountable to people that are mature and they're all confirming the word and you fight against it, you're only hurting yourself. Because when you step into his perfect will, 
wow, can't get any better than that. I'm only hurting myself if I don't do it. So Paul says, I asked, Lord, who are you? And the Lord answered, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Well, I thought I was persecuting those people that say they believe in you. Well, they've taken on a new identity, and they're my ambassadors. So when you persecute them, you're persecuting me. <laughs> Get up and stand upright on your feet. This is like Trisha's favorite line. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. <laughs> That's what Paul's being given new orders by a new king and a new commander. It's not the chief priest anymore, it's God saying, I'm commissioning you into a new army. Get up, stand up right on your feet. I've appeared to you for a reason. I'm appointing you to serve me. Who will I send? Here I am, Lord. Send me. You're to tell my story and how you have now seen me, and you are to continue to tell the story into the future. I'll rescue you from your Jewish opponents and from the outsiders, for it is to the outsiders that I'm sending you. And if you know anything about Paul, this wouldn't look like a real logical move by God, because Paul was an expert on the law. So you'd think, well, God, you should be sending me to the Jews. You sure you want to do that, God? I got a better idea. You ever do this? No, he's got a better idea. Don't worry. You may not fully understand what he's telling you in the moment. You probably won't. But you don't need all the next steps. You just need the next step. And that's what he's saying. That's what God's, Paul is testifying to Agrippa. This is what God told me. That I'm supposed to go to unbelievers, non-Jews, people who are far from God. The ones I thought could never even get into God's kingdom. It will be your mission to open their eyes. Do you remember where I started? Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes. Set our hearts ablaze. This is going to be your mission, Paul, to open their eyes. But what about us? Alex, what do you think? Is that your mission? To open up people's eyes to Jesus. Rich, you in? Yes. Elena, keep, hold them accountable. This is all of us. How beautiful. You don't even have to preach a sermon that people could see Jesus in you and their eyes could be open to the Lord just by watching how you behave. There are some scholars that think that's why he sent them out two by two because their behavior was so different in the way they interacted with the culture. That itself was a witness because nobody in those days forgave anyone. Nobody thought to be humble was any kind of positive thing. It was all about power. Sound familiar? That's what they're still talking about today. It'll be your mission to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. Oh, that's a message. And this is so that they may receive the forgiveness of all their sins and have a place among those who are set apart for a holy purpose. Can we stand? If you feel like you've been set apart for a holy purpose, can you raise your hand? Because I know it's true. I know it's true for all of us. We didn't just get saved so we can avoid hell when we die. We got saved to spill Pellegrino. We got saved to make a difference. And, and we can't all measure ourselves against each other or try to come up with some kind of scale and rank people. Because really, what, what did he say? That's the best title right there is washing somebody's feet, is to be a servant, right? So I just want to encourage you that your, your prayer time is not supposed to be boring. There's nothing boring about being in the service to the Lord. It's exciting. There's all kinds of exciting, amazing things that happen as you make yourself available for him to use you. And, and somebody said it, Tim said it when we was praying this morning, God takes the stones from the broken down walls of Jerusalem, the burned stones and the broken ones, and he uses those to rebuild the wall. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that he could take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around for good through your life that he could use you to touch somebody else's life. So that's our prayer. Can you say it after me? I'll show you the picture again. Open our eyes. Set our hearts ablaze. So Lord, I just bless your people right now that, that sat and absorbed what you wanted to say to them today. And I pray it sinks in that we would not be carnal, casual Christians just trying to make the cut when we die, but to be your ambassadors and your emissaries while we're here. That in this 
period between Passover and Pentecost that we could focus on all the times you appeared to your people and the ways you revealed yourself to them and that we could apply it to our lives. Even fasting and praying during these seven weeks, Lord, because Pentecost was such a game changer. It changed the whole world again. Your resurrection changed the world and then Pentecost changed it again. So we want to live in Pentecost. We want to live in Acts chapter 29 where we're seeing people's lives transformed by your power. And we say, start with us. Say it with me, all right? Start with me. Start with me, Lord. Transform me by your power. Open my eyes. Set my heart ablaze. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all very much.